out. He's going to change the sensors on it and uh, the board. It's going to cost like $400, half the price of a new one. <coughs> so, well, that's not bad, though. Yeah. I just bought a new one. It's for the station, though, so it's not like... Yeah. No. Well, I mean, fill you in on the new grill that we didn't get. They gave us new grates instead, and then... I, somebody I, try to cook turkey burgers on them before they were seasoned. seasoned. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> I think we all knew it was going to happen, but nobody, okay. nobody said anything. Shh. Just watch. <laughs> I knew we weren't going to get a new grill because when Kyle put in the, the request, he was like, we just either need uh, new parts or a new grill. No, nah, you got to be specific. Yeah, yeah, I, no, I was like, Kyle, rookie mistake right there. I said, Kyle, <laughs> Kyle, don't say that. And then sure as shit, what came in, the new parts for yep. the old grill. I'm like, shit. Yep. Well, that's, hey, just band-aid it back together. Yeah. That's. Yeah, a little duct tape never hurt your feet. Your feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it gets, adds a little flavor. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome to the Washdown Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Green. With me, co-host, Chris Nelson. And today we are talking with David Quintero. And David, you've been a firefighter for what, 12, 13 years now. 12 years. 12 years now and Marine Reserves. Yes. So why don't we start with how you got in the fire service? What made you want to be a, a firefighter? Well, growing up, I grew up in the city and my high school, there was a fire station right around the corner and I would see them come and go all the time. And I always wanted to be like them, you know, it sounds like a little kid, you know, looking up to someone, but that's how it actually was. I would see them going out every day and the respect that they would get because I, I worked at a grocery store as well and they would come in and everyone would always look up to them and they would be friendly to you and, and just, I was like, that's who I want to be. I want to be someone that is respected in the community, but also is a hard worker that contributes and protects his community. So I, I always knew I wanted to be someone that served, you know. Okay. So I, I knew at a young age that that's what I wanted to do. Cool. So what did that journey look like for you? Graduate high school, go to college? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> um, well, I had two two careers in mind, um, and I knew them both early on. I knew right away I said I'm going to be in the military, and I'm also going to be a firefighter. So I'm going to do the military reserve, and so – I knew right away I had already signed up. So I knew as soon as I graduated, I was going to be off to the races to boot camp. And I'm going to use that money for the GI Bill to pay for my college. So that was the goal. And my civilian job back home was to be a firefighter. So, yeah, as soon as I graduated high school, you know, went to boot camp 2001 and that so nothing was, going on in yeah, 2001. Nothing, nothing going on. <laughs> so graduated in May 2001, came back from boot camp, get your 10 days leave. And uh, on the 11th day, flying back to combat training was, uh, I don't know if you guys remember the date, September 11th, uh, 2001. Yeah, yeah. it vaguely rings a bell. <laughs> yeah, I don't so, know why. <laughs> so I'm in the air and I'm flying back and... Uh, back to California for more training, and I get to Texas, and Fort Worth is like a little city, you know. I get to, and it's it's alive, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I get there, it's eerie, just eerie, eerily quiet, you know. Like, what happened? What's going on? And there's these little, it looked like prayer groups going on, and so I get to my connecting flight, and I see a bunch of other jarheads, and they're excited, you know. I'm like, What's going on? You know, they're like, we're going to war. And I'm like, Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I signed up for college money. <laughs> no, that's not why I did it. You know, I, I knew signing up w what the, the risk were. And so, yeah, but <clears throat> so I did that, came back and, and then I just, uh, so soon after that, I started uh, junior college and I'd waited for the application process for this job. Um, I missed it because I was gone for training. What I didn't know was you could apply remotely for our de department, but um, so I missed that ball. But I ended up getting on in between training and being activated with the military, and luckily I got on my first try and 
12 years later, I love it. And something, it was everything I expected. I, I expected some unexpected stuff and, and wow. yeah, it was, it's great. I love it. So, so what did you do? We'll just kind of go chronologically. What did you do in the military for that time before you came back and went with the fire service full time? Let's see. So I, I did training in 2001. Um, then I was a reserve. I did, um, my job was ammunition. So I did ammunition, uh, in the reserves. And then 2003, I was activated for the first time and got sent to Camp Pendleton. They sent half of our unit to Iraq, half of our unit stayed to supply, um, the people that were still being trained Mm -hmm. back in the rear. So I did that for six months to eight months, somewhere around there. Came back reserves again. And I, I really wanted to go to combat, you know, I, I signed up for it. So I, I was one of the ones that take me, I'm, I'm ready. Let's, let's do this. But I didn't get my chance that time. Came back, tried to get on. I was on a couple lists, 2005, uh, since I was on a list to be activated, they're like, all right, we're sending you. I'm like, okay, let's do this. And then I looked at my order, Stuttgart, Germany. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, let's go. So they're like, oh, it's, it's a lot closer. I'm like, okay, whatever. So went out there and I uh, worked in the headquarters out there and it, it was a, it was a unique job. I was basically a guard for headquarters, but also we worked in that command center. You see it on TV where they have all the screens around and we knew everything that was going on in the theater of, of Europe. I mean, we knew how many people were here, there, 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 there. You hear stuff that no one, I can't even, I still can't talk about, you know, so it it was a unique experience. And, um, I also did some time where they would kind of lend me out to other units and I would go over to help out with the, the hospital over there, launch tool. And I think that was right before wounded warrior was getting set up, but that was when we were starting to get a lot of influx of people being injured. And so that, that's the big stopping off point. You know, there's hospitals in country, but then they come to Germany, get them patched up well enough to send them back stateside. So yeah, that's a, that's a unique, I mean, that's, I felt privileged to do that. So it's, it's pretty, it was pretty awesome. Not awesome in the fact that they were injured, but awesome in the fact that these guys, you think their morale or their spirits would be broken, but man, they, the guys in wheelchairs would help the guys in the beds and, you know, they would say, Hey man, good to see you. And just keep each other. You know, they were still continuing to, to have that brotherly bond. So I did that for, I was out there a year and a half, came back. And then I worked for reserves again. So I, I kind of would get activated reserve, activated reserve. I worked <clears throat> in um, a station that, a reserve station that allowed me to come on active duty. And we were in charge of sending guys back to Iraq and Afghanistan and making the phone calls. Hey, guess what? You thought you were done. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Shh. Oh man, that's um, got to be some sucky phone calls. To yeah, make. yeah, yeah. Because some of them, they you know, once they get out and they're still on contract, they're like, oh, "I'm out, I'm done." But you signed a contract, so yeah. a lot of them, we would have to kind of bring them back in. And after they got back in, we actually picked them up at the airport, and they were disgruntled for a little bit, you know. But after a while, they they fall right back into let's get the job done. Yeah. And then that unit moved down to. Um, New Orleans and as soon as I got on the fire department I had just dropped my gear in my locker at my permanent station and I get a phone call hey guess what we need you again I'm like okay <laughs> so I went down there and I heard really bad things about New Orleans but it was great it's I mean the people I make friends wherever I go and just you know new experiences and you know people drive like crap but uh yeah but other than that the culture and the food and the experience and 
and down there I worked with a lot of uh, Marines that were combat hardened and very seasoned and you know being in for that long anyone over five or six years had some sort of experience with combat and uh and and those guys you know now at that point in my career I'm in charge of these people you know and my good buddy he's in charge of the other group of people and we're working with these people that are warriors but they're broken and now you shove them in an office and like okay play nice (laughs) (laughs) i I can imagine that everything just went perfectly worked like (laughs) clockwork (laughs) yeah so yeah i did do a couple other little things here or there but uh, i wouldn't consider them combat i mean they were in dangerous areas but um but yeah i I'm one of the ones that I think my mom probably prayed too hard for me <laughs> because my hand was up and it was on list. But um, yeah, I just I just feel um, you know that's that was was in the cards for me at, for my military career. Uh, I have 16 years now. I'm actually getting back in, and if they need me, my hand is still up. So yeah, that's that's kind of my progression through the military, and All right. you know. So it kind of overlapped with fire service. Yeah. So you got in the fire service. And then peer support. What kind of took you down? Like, was there a catalyst, a moment, you know, what made you get involved with with that? I I think it goes back to the military. Um seeing these individuals that were very strong protector warriors, they, they teach from day one, you're warriors, you know, our job is to fight and win wars and they, and they beat it into you. And then you see someone that is just, I mean, so tough break down in tears, you know, it, it, it changes you, you know, it, you know, because someone like that, that is told and that, at a very influential age is, is taught that breaks down just, and doesn't know where to go. You don't, you don't ever want to see that. It's like seeing Superman die or something like that. Like you don't want to see, you know, someone that you look up to or, you know, cause I've seen that more than a few times where not, not cry, but just either have addiction problems or, uh, start screwing up at work and lose everything, lose their wife. And then just, or even just come back to the civilian world and just completely lost because all they know is I'm a warrior. And now what am I? So seeing that in the fire service, I I see that as well. It's different. It's not the same, but you see that protector kind of vibe. You see that, that role of this person is, when someone's in trouble, that's who you call, you know? So these individuals, you know, are held to a higher standard when it comes to you know, that emotional load and that, that stress level that they can take and, and everyone has a certain level. And, you know, so seeing people like that struggle, you know, I, I try to get to know people on a personal level and because I, I want to look out for that because I want to hopefully facilitate them staying in and doing what they're doing longer because we all need a break no matter what no matter if you're in corporate america you can get stressed out you need a break you need a vacation but with this type of job it's unique and who can you talk to but each other and that's kind of the the thing behind peer support and that's great is it makes the peer supporters able to be facilitators for our own people so you can probably talk to a fireman better than a lawyer about your problems, you know, cause they understand the language. They might not have been there exactly the same thing, but they kind of know like, okay, this, this guy kind of gets it, you know, and this guy has no idea. So, yeah. So, yeah, yeah we've, we've talked about the uh, cultural competency. Yeah. We've talked about that quite a bit. Um, as far as, you know, whenever it does get to the point of, 
you're looking for a therapist or a counselor or something like that to have someone who knows the culture and be, you know, culturally competent. Mm -hmm. It makes a huge difference on being able to talk to them versus whoever that has no idea that you may go in there and start talking about, you know, whatever the worst call you've ever been Mm -hmm. on. And the counselor ends up crying. (laughs) And then, so what do we do? We're like, Oh, it's, it's okay. You know, you're not getting any benefit out of that. So, yeah. Yeah. But, and it's kind of like we were talking with, with James earlier that, you know, that being able to talk to other guys and be open and honest and communicate, there's so much value in that Mm -hmm. because yeah, he may not have done the same thing that I've done, but we've done similar stuff Mm -hmm. or we might've been on that call together and we can sit there and we can talk about it, go over it, you know, figure it out for ourselves and then move on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we do that. We've, we've done peer support organically since we've been on, you can remember coming back from a bad call you know, something where someone got injured and and that really hit home to almost everyone or a fire that was unfortunately a fatality fire or a fatality wreck. And you come back to the station and everyone sits down at the table and you, you have that moment of, man, what happened? That's crazy. Mm -hmm. And that, that natural, you, you decompress and you, and then you talk about it with each other because you were there he or she understands, yeah. you know, so, I mean, that's kind of what we try to do. You know, we, we just try to reach out a little bit further than that reach of that hot wash at that kitchen table. So, right. So have you seen like an expansion in the use since you've been involved with it or has it just been kind of steady? It, it's always for me, I, I've, I only get called when I'm, I'm needed. And, and normally they call me whenever it's more military, like they're ex military as well as okay firemen. So you guys specialize. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think I'm one of the, there, I think there's three or four of us that are uh, military and they'll kind of pick us like, cause it, it's like that counselor or that therapist, like you might see three before you find someone that you, you can actually talk to. Yeah. So they can pick from one or the other to, to find out which one's going to best suit that person. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I, I think that's great too that, you know, so whenever I'm called upon it, I'll stop what I'm doing. You know, I've been called in the middle of the night and Hey, we need you to drive to Springfield, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. You know, let me, let me get some clothes on and some coffee in me and, I'll head that way. So, so is it like not just for our department, but it's area? Yes, it's an area peer support. Team. Yeah, I I went to a, a smaller department one day, and um, they had unfortunately they had a um, a suicide of one of their members, and their basically half of their department was there because they had only two shifts. So when I went there, I I grabbed another. And that's what we can do too. I, I called upon one of my other, our other guys and was like, Hey, I need you to come with me because I thought in my head of all the guys, and I was like, guys and gals. And I was like, this guy is going to be able to work good because he's more this and I'm more that. So hopefully we can try to cover as many as possible because I mean, it hit home and it hit home hard for them. So, and it was yeah. still fresh. So so yeah, we we we'll go out to other departments and other around the area. So it's through the international. So I think you can even go on their site and there's a link to peer support and there should be all the peer supporters. Okay. See, that's stuff I didn't yeah, know. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know the international had that on the. And I think it's. Uh, I think it'll say Fire Strong, I believe. Um, and through it, our our local, if you go through there or the international, I, I believe there should be links, you know, on most pages, on most locals to their individual peer supporters. Because yeah. that's the training I went through was through the international and, and they came down and, and 
and great group of trainers, great group of guys and gals that came down and, and trained and gave their personal experiences and stories. And, and it makes you think like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to help people, help the people that help people. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so, and I mean, that's gotta be, we kind of talked about it a little bit before, but a little bit, and I don't want it to sound bad, but a little bit more rewarding than just like normal call. You, does that make sense? Like being able to help a fellow firefighter, EMT, whatever, it's kind of, it just a little bit more sense of sat- satisfaction or, you know, yeah. or maybe I'm off base. Well, I don't know. No, um, I, I think it's a different experience and, and yeah, it's, it's a unique because uh, again, that goes back to how, you know, the people that you call for help shouldn't need help, but everyone needs help. Yeah. So y- you take it closer to, to heart when you do it, because man, these are people that are, you know, we need them. We need you to be, you know, the best you can be a hundred percent or as close to it. So you take special care with it. And there was one time where I, I was called out and I said, well, you know, if I didn't feel like I was getting through and I said, if, if this isn't helping, you know, I don't have all the answers, but we have other peer supporters and I can get you in touch with another person. And if not, I can facilitate you to get to the next level, whether that be counseling or, um, if you're thinking bad right now, we can, I will drive with you, take you to the emergency room, you know? And so yeah, it, it, you, you try so hard because these guys and gals are, are trying so hard to, you know, we, we need them. So, yeah. And, and it's not a permanent thing. I think we talked about that off at, um, at the station, you know, people see PTS, stress, anxiety, depression, you know, they all try to group it into this PTSD, you know, ball when it's just so many different, it's so many sides and so many different degrees where one guy just might have a stressful week. The other guy might be going through a divorce and losing everything. So, I mean, there's different degrees of it. So, you know, we, you just have to take care like, okay, this guy, you know, he just needs, Hey man, you can do it. Hey, what can I do to help you? Call me and check in this one. I have to, you know, really like, like the suicide of someone like take extra special care. Not that I don't care over here as much, but right. You know, well, it's that whole, like you said, it's, it's different degrees of stuff and it all gets, like you said, lumped in together. So, it's yeah, this guy needs the attaboy, you're doing a good job, you know, yeah, it's been a rough week, you know, but the other guy, everything's falling apart, mm-hmm. so he needs a lot more, and I don't want to make it sound bad by saying hand-holding, mm-hmm. but that's what it is, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, so this is what it is, now we need to get you to the appropriate level of mm-hmm. resources, whether that be you know, like you say, inpatient or a counselor or something like that. It's being able to facilitate that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that's the biggest thing with peer support is we're not clinicians. It's, well, on, on my level, what we do, you know, we are not uh, doctors. We're not therapists. You know, we have minimal training and they give you a big booklet. And I, I, I think a lot of us took the time to, when I was in it at least, I was seeing the people that were taking the course highlight, you know, and like earmark and, you know, circle and taking, you know, taking it serious, taking it very seriously. Like that book wasn't just, I follow along with that. It was, if you, if you need help, if you know, if you know, read this book and, and it, you know, they all took it very serious. And I even did some follow up, some resilience training and, that kind of goes hand in hand with, you know, peer support is our resiliency of being able to bounce back because like I said, we have the different degrees of it. Right. You know, you, you can bounce back, you know, it's, it's not a permanent thing unless you get to 
that final stage. So. Yeah. Well, and that's something that not a lot of people talk about is, you know, post-traumatic growth. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody's like, oh, PTSD and this. and that. Well, yeah, PTS is totally freaking natural. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody goes, if you have a traumatic event, mm-hmm. and we'll just say trauma, everyone responds to it differently. Right. And what mm-hmm. may be traumatic to you may not be for him or me. It, there's no formula for it. Mm-hmm. That's going to say, okay, everyone is going to be affected the exact same. It's just not true. It's not going to happen. But what people need to realize, and it needs to be kind of put out there a lot more. And it's kind of starting to, is that you can grow, you can come through, you're going to come through the other side of it mm-hmm. and be stronger, more resilient you know, and then at the end of it, okay, I dealt with that. It was shitty. It sucked. Mm-hmm. Now what? Okay, well, I've grown. I'm not the same person I was before, and you're not going to be, but you can be better than you were before. Yeah. You're going to be different, and you can take those experiences, pass them on. Yep. You can help someone else get through it. You can remember that for the next time. So, yeah. Uh, you know, it's like body hardening, you know, you, I've felt this pain before. I felt this stress before I've, I've been where, but I know last time it was tough, but I came out on the other side. Yeah. It's happening again and I, I can do this. So it's being more resilient. If it happens again, you know, yeah. Yeah. I know the steps that I took, you know, to get through it last time. Yeah. So I can take those same steps again and guess what? Along the path, maybe it doesn't work as well or, you know, something's a little bit different. Okay. But now I know I've made it through last time. I can make it through this time. Yeah. So, okay, this step didn't work. What do I do instead? Okay. I'm going to figure that out. Yeah. Being open to, to different facets, different ways of tackling issues is, is probably, it, it reminds me of the fire service, you know, like, we may have a, um, say a shorter press call, which is a common call for, you know, most departments and you go in, you're thinking, Oh, it's going to be this. And it could be, they're having a severe asthma attack and we we're doing the whole workup, you know, ventilating and bagging and starting IVs and stuff. Or it could be that guy that just is sitting on saying, sitting on the couch saying, Oh, I just can't breathe very well. You know? Yeah. So, each thing you can't go in like a cookie cutter, like this for this, this for this, this for this, that for that, that for that, that for that, you know, you can try this or you can try that. You can try resilience training. You can try getting exercise, breathing exercises, taking some vacation, you know? So it's just trying to do whatever you can to get the end result. Because like in the military, I remember mission accomplishment, it doesn't matter how we get there. We just got to get there. We just got to put out the fire or we got to get this person to the hospital or we have to get this person back to where they were so they can perform their job. So, yeah. Got to learn to adapt. Yeah. Adapt and overcome. (laughs) (laughs) Glad you said it. I wanted to so bad. I did. I love that phrase. Oh, and proper preparation prevents piss poor performance is also one of my (laughs) favorites. So, but, and that's, that's something else that, you know, we need to talk about in the fire service is we don't really prepare for the whole mental aspect of it. Oh, a a lot of places. I mean, we, they don't prepare you for stuff like this. Uh, I'm not saying everyone, I'm hopefully other places are starting to catch on and it's infectious and we, we get this going and I I hate referring back to the military because I try to keep it very separate, but I try to use everything I've learned to try to make their lessons, past experiences. Yeah. So use the um, tools in the toolbox, tools in a toolbox, right? So one thing that they do have in the military is, uh, these periodic health assessments. And I think they're great they do like a baseline like early in your career your for your mental health and every well i think they used to do them 
uh, you know, things are ever changing in the military, but they used to do them when you come back from a deployment or an activation or you're, um, without your family or so every 30, 90, 120 days you'd come in and they would ask you questions. And just being asked a question makes you think about it. Like one would be, are you depressed? Well, I haven't really thought about it. <laughs> are you stressed? Well, I kind of am. <laughs> so because, you know, it was new, you know, after I think it started, those started, um, and they could have been before that, but uh, I remember after 9-11 and, and people started coming back from, they would do these periodic health assessments, and they were very important. And we would actually catch a lot of early stages of, you know, signs that people were going to either hurt themselves or they were having some PTS or PTSD in the works or, you know, so I would like to see something like that. Hopefully we can get something where it's it's at least maybe an annual, you know, even if it's just how do you feel today, one to ten, you know, tucked away, just so we can see, okay, there's a pattern of progression or you're or even before they get there, okay, this guy's a five out of 10. If you're a five, you know, get a stack of them, you know, and say, what can we do to get you back down, you know, to, to where you're going to be able to feel better, you know, yeah. before the problem is a 10. Bef yeah. So, yeah. Well, and I think that it kind of falls on or doesn't fall on, but it's something that, I think we could do a lot better with especially, you know, cause it's, it's partially a culture shift that needs to happen. But having, whenever we have new hires come in, new people into the fire service, there's gotta be a way that we can better prepare them, you know, for what they're going to see. And it, there's no way that you can prepare somebody for some of the things that we see but there's got to be a way to better prepare them to cope with it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't want to go off topic, but I think we yeah. talked about this too, but uh, the generational differences. Um. Yeah. So we've had many conversations about that <laughs> <laughs> on and off. Oh man. Podcast. Yeah. Like it, like it, it's not off topic. This is a kitchen table basically yeah. at the fire station. Think of it that way. There is no <laughs> off topic. We can go over here. We can go over there. Yeah. It's all good. So you were talking about how to get new hires to, you know, have something for them. Um, I go back to, you know, tool in the toolbox, mission accomplishment. We have a job to do. Um, and you may have on your rig that day, two new guys and two old guys and you'll get the job done. But you may have that one day where you have 10 years experience total. I've been there mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, and it's a scary feeling, you know, like I'm eligible to be the captain for the day. And this guy's barely eligible to drive for the day. And these are two floaters that just came out of the Academy. And it's like, Oh man, <laughs> if something happens, we're going to have to call the real fire department. <laughs> yeah. Guess what? You are the real fire department. That, that, that's a good situation for broken arrow, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but on, on those days, it, it, it makes me think like, it doesn't matter who you have, you know, we have to get the job done. We have a, a mission Absolutely. to do. So that diff, that, younger generation, you know, and, and I've done research in because going back to military, I've noticed this shift of, of generations and every generation before is like, Oh, this new generation, these <laughs> kids, they don't know shit from blah, blah, you know, but yeah. so sounding old, I, I'm trying not to, I'm just trying to think of how can I communicate to them? But then I thought about, it, I'm like, okay, I've watched all these videos and had, had this training to, to try to help this generation, you know, how to utilize the new generation to get them to accomplish the mission, to put out the fire, to help this person at a car wreck or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. But that generation needs to be taught how to work with our generation and the other generation. You know, so that's something that I'm trying currently is, and not just me, I say me, but people of my seniority, you know, I have, we have conversations like this, you know, like 
how can we get them to where we need them to be? If we step up and try to help them, they have to step up too. And the biggest thing is the, the fear of, of failing, the fear of embarrassment. Like, so we embarrass them. <laughs> <laughs> you just started at our station. I mean, we, yeah. we, we have a good time, but we also, we, we joke around and we, we get them accustomed to, um, and, and it happens a lot of stations, you know, you, we have that, you know, talking crap and giving them a hard time kind of did initiation, but it's kind of growing your thick skin for other things. Like you may be on a call and someone may, you know, a lot going on that prepares you in the station for stuff that could happen outside the station, you know, on a call. So, and we tell them, don't be afraid to get in there. And, and if you do it wrong, you can mess up. Just don't F up. Just don't fuck up. You know? So yeah. <laughs> that, that that's kind of my thing is, uh, you gotta, like, we're all going to mess up. If you're going to learn, you got to learn how to, you got to learn how to jump in and swim. Exactly. That's, that's the thing with this job. And anything is you can't wait in the water. You can't do it. You got to, you got to jump in feet first with cement blocks on and figure it out real quick. Yep. But it's all, but all that training we do in the Academy makes those cement blocks smaller. And you have the guys next to you that have been out there hold, helping hold you up and float around because mm-hmm. they're not gonna let you drown. Mm-mm. Let you play around for a little bit, but we're not going to drown. We <laughs> might laugh and point. <laughs> you know, that's just that's the nature of the, of the job, and I think mental health is kind of the same way. You don't know how you're going to react to something until it happens. We can prepare, right. so we start preparing early in the academy. Start having maybe have a couple classes on it, and then you've got you've got the groundwork. So when something does happen. Now you've got something to fall back on, but you got the guys next to you helping hold you up and float. Yeah. That way you don't drown. That's good. That good man. I took a long I, way to get there. Yeah. <laughs> I do that a lot. Yeah. I, I've had talks about that that too, about that good solid foundation. So yeah, I mean, you, gotta have you it. said it, you said it in the academy or in the beginning of your training. We gotta talk about it. We gotta talk about these things. We gotta And some people will say, Oh, if you Tell people that there's this invisible, you know, disability that they can get, you know, they're going to think that they have it just by mentioning. No, you're not. You with, with anything good, you're going to have people trying to take advantage of it, Mm -hmm. but you still got to throw it out. there. You still got to, you still got to put it out there, you know, because one person taking their life is, is one too many. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, like you said, people will take advantage of it. That's just, because that's just people that's just people but we're doing a disservice to the rest of the people who would utilize a program like peer support or whatever that maybe they wouldn't if they felt like oh well if i use this then i'm going to be seen as weak and you know this and that and then they stay in that shell and stuff just keeps spiraling 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 until Mm -hmm. it's too late we have to remove the stigma Mm mm-hmm you know, and we have to give people the coping skills and we have to start that stuff early because the sad fact of the matter is that like we talked about trauma is going to happen and you don't know how you're going to react to it until it happens. Yeah. And it could be, you know, you could go on 50 car wrecks and they don't bother you at all. But then the 51st car wreck, because it looks like the car your mom drove mm-hmm. or it looks like, you know, they had a dog in it that y- you never know you never what know. it's going to be, but it's, it's going to happen. But it's that, yeah. it's that, it's that build up of the other 50. Yeah. Your 51st your is your tipping point. Yeah. That, that breaks that, the floor off from under you. Yeah. Cause all those, everything fo- comes out. Cause all those 50 before we probably didn't handle them correctly oh, yeah. or I mean, not correctly, but I mean, it adds up, but every now and then you got to empty that. You put them in that bucket or that cup. Every now and then you got to dump that cup out. Yeah. You're still going to have the remnants of and the memories mm-hmm. of that, but you got to empty it out yeah. so you have more room. Well, yeah. And it's, I've heard lots of analogies about it. I mean, oh, here comes the box, <laughs> the cardboard box. <laughs> you got to hear this again. Uh, that's why I said bucket. I yeah. said cup. You know, I yeah. mean, I've now, heard Jer- box. Jeremy's got a good one. I do like it. Now, and a lot of people think, 
you know, a compartmentalization or whatever. So they think, okay, I'm going to put it back here and I'm just going to put it in my iron box and it's going to just stay there. Mm -hmm. That's not what it is. In reality, it is a leaky, soggy, wet cardboard box that you're stuffing all this crap in. And guess what? The more stuff you stuff in, the more stuff leaks out. (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) you're, you're not doing it. You're not helping anything. You're not helping yourself. You, like you said, you have to empty it yeah. out. You have mm-hmm. to process it. Yeah. And then, yeah, you're still going to have those memories. Yeah. They're, they're not going to go away. Yeah. What changes the emotions attached to the memories? Yep. Yeah. And it could be, man, it, this is a, a story that kind of blew my mind. It was, we, we ran a call and it was an old veteran from Vietnam era. And he was still in, for his age, he was in great shape. I mean, he was and the life he he led, he was in great shape. So we respond and we get there and family's like, he's having a, he's have he's, he's crazy. You know, he's, he's yelling, he's talking about hurting himself and other people. And he's, he's, we don't know, he, he lost control. He was, he just completely, you know, had a, a panic attack with a psychotic episode. And it was, it was, it was a unique situation. We go in there and we're, we always worry about our safety and, and the safety of the family and the patient. So we're trying to get in there and figure out how we're going to do it. And <clears throat> finally there was two of us that were prior military. And, and I, I don't bring that up um, when we're doing it because the focus is the patient. Mm-hmm. And so we focus on the patient. We, we finally get the patient ag- that he agrees that for his family, he's going to get looked at because before he didn't want to go, I'm not, you can't make me do anything. And then, we get him in there and I ride with because I built a little bit of a rapport with him by now. And I asked him like, Hey, if, if you don't mind, you know, I, I thank him for his service. And especially with Vietnam veterans, I, I, I like to say welcome home because when a lot of them came home, you know, they were, they were, they came back to people spitting on them, calling them baby killers, ba- baby the killers and then all this yeah. other crap, yeah. which is bullshit. Terrible. So, so I was talking to him. I said, well, what's going on? What, what's different lately? And he's like, man, my best friend, you know, that I grew up with, you know, he died a few days ago. You know, we did everything together. You know, we, we did this, we did that. We joined the military together. We went to Vietnam together, and that was it. That was the trigger. However many years later was his friend's death, and it just sent him. You know, and the family said he's never had one episode. He has never had a problem with panic attacks or freakouts or anything. Not once. But it took that one time yeah. that filled that box up, and yeah. that was it. Yeah, so the box was, broke open and everything came spilling out. Yeah, yeah. So, and you know, that's just a—it's a perfect illustration of if you don't take it out and deal with it that's what will happen, Mm -hmm. you know, and especially people in our line of work, we see that stuff on a daily basis. And if we're not dealing with it, then, I mean, the typical thing seems to be, well, we're going to go get a drink or we're going to do this or do that. And to try to kind of numb it, forget about it, whatever. And you can only do that for so long. That, that can be good in, in moderation, you know, um, but that's not. Uh, well, there has to be something that goes along with it. Yes. I it can't just be. Go if you're get just it. drinking. It's going to make that box leakier. Yeah. And it's going to leak faster. Yeah. But yeah, if it's so if it's a drink. While you're and talking a conversation. About, and, and, and we're having something like this. Yeah. And, and even if it's. Um, I've noticed uh, in the peer support where sometimes we won't even talk about the issue. Sometimes we'll just talk, you know, and just to talk. Just so they know that someone is there. Someone's listening. Someone's listening. So that's all it takes. Because I mean, I've noticed that the the conversations we have at the station after a call that helps tremendously. Absolutely. Might not seem like it in the jokes we make, and then you know, like hey, you know, you know, your butt crack was hanging out on the call the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that kind of stuff. We all did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like, don't I know worry. I felt you. I felt you touch it. <laughs> don't, you don't worry, we got a picture. We'll show <laughs> yeah. you later. Yeah, yeah, but but all that helps you deal with the stress from that call, whatever it was. 
and like what you were saying earlier with, with on the last episode with Kelly of moving it from this part of your brain to the other. So that way you don't have that bad emotional response anymore. But it's yeah, amazing yeah. how far a conversation can take something and you don't even realize it. Yeah. yeah. Something small. Well, you know, I mean, there are a million coping skills, probably a million and one. Yep. It, you just got to pick which one works for you. You got to figure it out. Tools in a toolbox. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah, the more you buy, the more you learn, the better you are. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Two in a hand, one in a bush. What? Uh, I thought we were just throwing out <laughs> random stuff. I'm huh? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it takes one to know one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one works. Well, yeah. I mean, that's you, apropos. Think about it. Have you, have, did you ever call the, uh, have you ever talked to anybody who's used EAP? Mm hmm. I mean, how many good experiences? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because they don't. Because they don't understand. Yeah. You know, they're looking at. They, they got their little clinical book, mm -hmm. and they're going down. Yeah. That's it. They're not. Yeah. They're not really listening, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of, and I get to see this a little bit, you know, because I have a different perspective of it, because my wife's a counselor, but it seems to be very fashionable and in vogue right now for counselors to be. Oh, I want to work with military and first responders. And they jump in with both feet and have no idea what they're getting into. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because I mean, it, it, we are a different, it's a different culture. It, it, it is. It's unique. Yeah. It is unique. And you're a different breed too. It, it's and, not just, it's just and, the yeah. things we say and do. And I you mean, were, you were talking about how like making fun of the guy after we, we come back. Sometimes it's, it's a little bit more. What's the word? Not jaded. Um, where we're we're joking about something that shouldn't be funny. Dark, dark, dark humor. Exactly. Yeah. It's the dark humor. Yeah. And and it's a way of disassociating. You know. Yeah. Make it to where it's almost not real. Yes. It's kind of like you're watching a, like watching a horror movie. Mm -hmm. You know it's all fake. Yeah. You know you know that actor's getting up and walking yeah. away after having their. And, and that that's a coping mechanism that that a lot of yeah. us do. But we're talking about it. We're we're. we're breaking that silence of oh we saw something gruesome mm -hmm. but now we're talking about like oh man you look like you were ice skating on that blood you know like <laughs> or whatever you know like <laughs> so but it, that's a unique situation mm -hmm. you know that maybe someone that has never been in the fire service or um you know EMS or police or military they have no idea how to relate you know you can read it in a book but you know, yeah. I've, I've read books on a lot of things until I actually get out there and do it. You know, yeah. I'm like, oh, Dude, now, now yeah. I get it. Because it's not just seeing it. Like, you can see a picture, but when you see it in person and you can, you hear the, they're, they're conscious, you hear the screams of pain, mm -hmm. there's a smell. The smell. And the smell never leaves you. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, and people that, don't understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things that it, it makes that memory stronger of having the other senses impacted by it. So smell, touch, taste, all of that stuff combined it adds to the power of that memory. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where the dark humor comes in. Yeah. And, you know, if you're on the outside and you hear that, I think we're a bunch of insensitive pricks. <laughs> no, <laughs> you we're, know, like, we're, we're not being, ass we're you, not being assholes. You know? It's just it's, our initial way uh, or of kind of a, a coping mechanism to get it out there and to try to remove ourselves from the pain that we may be feeling, even mm -hmm. though we might not show it on the exterior. Like, man, that kind of really sucked is what we're thinking. Yeah. yeah. Well, and sometimes making those jokes leads into that conversation. Yeah. You know, it's, you make that off color, dark humor joke or whatever. And then it kind of leads into, yeah, that was really messed up. Mm -hmm. it, you know, yeah, that kind of, every kind of opens up a little bit more. And yeah. All of a sudden, well, you're, ha you're having that, that hot wash or, mm -hmm. or whatever, and then you end up being better off in the long run than all because of a dark, dirty joke. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <clears throat> what, whatever gets us yeah. to where we need to be. Yeah, there's no, there's, there's no rule book on it, there's unfortunately, no, and you got to take no. whatever path you can. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, you know, it's getting people talking. And that's the hard part is because a lot of us would prefer to just suffer in silence, you know, 
because it is that, you know, I'm going to help everybody else. I don't need help. I can handle this. I got it. Yeah. Mm, but do you really? You know, there may be few that can probably go their whole life and, and do that. Tuck it, tuck it down and, and handle it. But that's probably not healthy, yeah. you know, and they can probably make it their whole life and, and never say a word. But yeah, the majority of people have a mental toughness, you know, maximum or a, you know, where they're completely full. Yeah. And, right. and for, for you, it may be higher than me. It may be lower than me. I mean, you may be higher than both of us combined as, as far as what you can handle or what you can handle or I can handle. But we, we have to know how to, to take care of that before we get to that point. Right. So it's a good practice to, even though we know like, yeah, we're going to push this one down. We'll be fine. Oh, that's another thing. We'll add it to that box. We'll push it down. It'll be fine. Yeah. We just need to periodically find a way to check in, whether that be on our own, whether that be around a table, just talking about it. So, well, I mean, you know, the bottom line, everybody's got a point where they will break. Nobody is, I mean, nobody's immune to it regardless. At least I don't think so. I don't think there's anybody out there that is unbreakable. They just, maybe you haven't seen the thing that's going to break you yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, or the combination of things. So you got to be able to, to deal with it, to learn how to deal with it. And then, you know, and, and we've had these conversations at the station and heard these conversations at the station of, well, maybe you just need to find a new career. I hate that conversation, but I also think that conversation may not be a hundred percent incorrect. For some that may be absolutely For, correct. Yeah. It, it takes like, like you said, a, a special breed. We are a special breed. And if you can't hack it, it's probably not good for your health, your mental health to be in this, this or other lines of profession that see trauma yeah. or unique situations on a regular basis. Yeah. And I think that's something that everybody needs to decide for themselves. Check in with yourself and figure that shit out. And the sooner you figure it out. And that's a strength too. Yeah. Being able to say, Hey, I recognize that this isn't for me. I'm going to call it a day. I, I gave it my all. I'm not quitting because I knew I got to this point. And for me, it's not the right decision. So I'm going to segue into something different, you know? So that's how we should look at it. If, if someone can't handle it, we need you to be there a hundred percent. And that's, that's the whole point of this is we're trying to make sure we're there as much as possible, you know, physically, emotionally, mentally. But if you have that person that is, Oh, I don't know if I can do this. Oh, I hope it's not gruesome or I hope it's not a, a work and fire or whatever it may be that you can't handle. And it is, you're putting everyone else in danger because you're not really there a hundred percent. Yeah. So it takes the courage to say, Hey, that's not for me. Yeah. But that, I mean, and there's no shame in that and we need to quit treating it that way. Yeah. You know, because if somebody does have the balls to say, you know what, this isn't for me and I'm going to walk away from it. All right, dude, I respect that decision because yep. you've taken the time to check in with yourself yep. and go do something else. Good luck. We have a thousand other guys. That will, gosh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be glad to have your job. Yeah. Hopefully one of them will be able to make it. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, it, it, that go kind of leads into the broader conversation about mental health though of being able to do that of being able to check in with yourself and know yourself because not every job is for every person hmm. you know i mean i i know it for myself i would make a terrible cop it just wouldn't I, be a good one i could see that yeah it's probably your face yeah <laughs> it's no, just mostly kidding. my face and yeah. partly my attitude yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, but I know that about myself and I was able to discern that early on before 
you know, I took those steps. So, and I think it, maybe that goes back to a generational thing. Like we were talking yeah. to earlier that, you know, I think a lot of parents and people are doing their kids a disservice by the way they're being raised doing everything for them and not letting them struggle and figure stuff out on their own. Let them fall down. They'll get back up. Yeah. People are resilient. They're more resilient yeah. than you think. And sometimes yeah. you need a little bit of help, but that's what mentoring and leader and being a leader, you know, even in the home or whatever, that's it's what the, all that's, that's about. The, it goes back to that whole, you, they're not gonna let you drown. Yeah. You know, touch a hot stove once. You're not going to do it again. Yeah. If you do it again, I'm I'm calling you a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you do that, dummy? <laughs> yeah, just, I know there's a lot of parents out there that, like, you watch your kid fall down, and if you don't acknowledge it, what's the kid do? They get up, burst themselves off, go back to playing. But if you always run over and coddle them, they're never going to learn how to dust themselves yep. off and keep going. Yeah. And that's a very... You know, it's a very basic, you know, description or analogy or whatever, but it's true. You know, you need to figure stuff out on your own a little bit and be resilient. And again, like I said, there's, there's a point, everybody needs some help at some point or may need some help at some point. And it's knowing, okay, I know myself, yeah. I know where I'm at right now. It ain't good. You know? Get on the phone, call somebody. Yeah. Or, you know, send up a smoke signal, fucking yeah. wave a flag. I don't give a shit. There's resources out there for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, I've heard it time and time again. You know, people talk about, well, yeah, you know, my mental health's important, but, you know, it just, counselors are so expensive. You got insurance? Guess what? There's somebody out there that takes your insurance yeah. or guess what? You call around. A lot of counselors do sliding scales mm -hmm. or you know what? Your company has an EAP program. You have a peer support program. There are things you can do that help or that can help. Yeah. The biggest thing is asking for it because if, if you're not able to find that person, reach out to um, one of our resources your, your local, the internationals page, you know, even, um, veterans pages, they'll have, um, 1-800 numbers that not only veterans can call, but you can call. And if you're not a veteran, they can refer you to, okay, you're not a veteran. So you, you're not eligible for this, but this is another outlet that you can try to right. try to go to, or this is a free app that you can download on every Apple or Android to help with that. I mean, there's, there's things out there that, that you can do. You just need to be, have the courage or just, you know, just know like, Hey, I need to check in, you know, and, um, it can be a, a unprofessional setting. It could be that buddy that, you know, you can always talk to, you know, or a family member that, uh, you know, was on the job or he, he, he's just a good listener. He or she is a good listener, you know, check in, you know, find that outlet to, to let that out. Yeah. So, so you can get back to back to work. Yeah. And then, like I said, there's, there's avenues and things you can do. So yeah. Well, agreed. Agreed. Is that what you're looking for? Well, I was <laughs> yes. looking for you to Positive. say something. You've been conspicuously silent. Most of this episode, my hip is killing me. I've had the shooting pain, kind of like what I had when I dropped. Uh, I don't know why. So I'm a little worried. It's, well, it's because you're weak. Sounds like it. See the look he's giving me? <laughs> I've been getting that look for 17 years. We're going to have a conversation <laughs> later. <laughs> you know like, I care about you, bro. No, you don't. Yeah, I do because oh, you, care, oh, you care about your podcast. Well, yeah. If we're not friends, I won't have a place to do my podcast. <laughs> I know. See, <laughs> you got like a quarter of a friend left. A quarter of a friend quarter left. A friend. I'll take it. <laughs> Keep digging. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's just an example of how 
firefighters communicate with yep, each other. There you go. <laughs> Remember our old instructor in the academy? Taught, the, taught EMS? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do to you later. Okay. If, was he still there when you were at the academy? Who's that? I don't want to say his name. What's yeah. it start with? Okay. It cut you. Did you ever hear that in the academy? He might have been retired by then. I think he was. It would have been right about that time. Oh, eight? Yeah, it was right about yeah. that time. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, he was a funny dude. It was. He, I, liked, I liked him a lot. Yeah. Even outside the academy, he was, yeah. he was great. His, uh, but that was his catchphrase. Yeah, his I'll catchphrase was, I'll cut you. That must have, he must have left. Yeah, he must have already yeah, retired. Because I, I, I think I'd remember something like yeah, that. Yeah, you'd, you'd remember that. You'd remember him teaching EMS. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But he well, was, I liked him a lot. He was big yeah. on the uh, mental health thing too. Just didn't recognize it. Yeah. Back then. Yeah, it's funny, you know, you whenever you really sit down and start thinking about it and going over it, there are things and people that, you know, we've known through our, throughout our career that we're talking, basically we're talking about mental health without talking about mental health mm -hmm. and saying, Hey, you know, make sure you've got this outside the job or you're doing this or you're doing that. Take care of things outside the job, take care of your family, make sure they're yeah. on your priority mm -hmm. list. Yeah. And you're there for them and stuff like that. Just, but just things. in, a, yeah, little things in a yeah. roundabout way that you don't think about like adding up to the sum of, you know, staying mentally fit to do the job mm -hmm. until you're at that point and you're like, oh, man, that's what have they been, meant. Yeah. I think Still, we, worst we, piece of advice though. Take your feelings, put them in a box, put them under your bed. You can have them back when you go home. <laughs> Worst advice ever. <laughs> totally not what compartmentalization is supposed to be. You know, I have to say this because it, you know, <laughs> we talk about mental health, PTS, stress, and all, every, you know, thing. There's different stages of it, but. So it sounds like if you if you see from the outside and you're watching this video or listen to this podcast, you're thinking that, oh, man, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of, you know, hurt and pain. For the most part, you know, we're not like that. There's a lot of sucking it up and being strong and being able to get through that. And that is great. So don't go into it. If you're a newer person like a a new recruit or, you know, thinking about it. Don't think that it's going to be just a sad thing. It is great. We yeah. have a, a great job. It It's crazy. It's unpredictable. You know, it, it's awesome. And there are, are some things where you're like, ah, oh, that wasn't bad. It's fine. But we are talking about knowing when that box is too full. So yeah. don't go and cry, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it goes back to the kid falling down. You're that kid falling down. You're you get back up, but if your bone is sticking out, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole different yeah, thing. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so don't think I, I yeah. get what you're saying. Yeah, it's not all it's doom not all, and gloom. Yeah. That's not the fire yes. service. Like, yeah, it is one of. If it's not the most rewarding job, I mean, it has got to be one of the most rewarding jobs that you will ever do because you will directly impact people's lives daily daily and i mean you know every day are you going to go do cpr on somebody and they're going to pop up and go yeah you know yeah. it's not chicago fire people that's not what happens it's better it, yeah <laughs> it's, it's cooler too yeah <laughs> but i mean you know you will directly impact people in your community and there's no better feeling than that. I think, I think going to the store is the best example of that. Just talking to people where you come out and there's, you know, a kid and his mom or her mom staring at the truck. You want to get in? And their face lights up. Oh, you must work in the, a different area of, of the city than, I, than me. <laughs> what are you guys doing here? Shouldn't you be at the fire station? 
Oh, oh we get that too. Oh yeah, we get that too. <laughs> I once, you know, even when I was in the in the core, going to the store, people were friendly. Yeah, you know, it's, it doesn't matter where, where you work in part in the city. It doesn't matter who you are. People want to talk to you. Yeah, and just by being nice and interacting with them, you're cha- you're making their day that much better. Yeah, you're you're changing just like when I was, you know, like like what you did when you were working in the inner city or inner parts of the town you saying that to a younger kid that kid may think i want to be a fireman when i grow up because that's exactly when i was sacking groceries at the grocery store i want to be a fire i remember the joke too that got me i was sacking the groceries and he was like sack them heavy we're we're not we're not pussies okay (laughs) i'll sack them heavy i i loaded every can good in the same thing double bagged it so it wouldn't rip but it was definitely heavy and he's like man he's like man that is heavy i'm like well that's what you said so (laughs) he he threw it out i threw it right back and then he's like well you want a tip real serious real straightforward i was like yeah i'll take a tip he was like don't play with matches. <laughs> and I was like, man, what a dick. But that's kind of awesome. <laughs> I'm going to be a fireman when I grow up. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's those interactions, yeah. you know? Yeah. And you never know. I mean, it's better for us to interact with people in that setting mm-hmm. than the one time they need to call 911. Because that could be their only interaction with a firefighter or an EMT or a police officer that they've ever had in their life. Yeah. You know? So yeah, interact with them at the store. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. Amazing how far just saying, how you doing a day goes. Yeah. Saying hi. To yeah. People. Yeah. Or we like cookies and we're at blah, blah, <laughs> 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 but they got to be keto. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm off to keto now. Mine doesn't oh, need to be keto. Keto just now? give me chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> no, I once, uh, at the old station that we worked at, we went to the store and, some dude freaking accosted us and had to listen to an almost five minute diatribe of how he was pissed off about how the city provided us food and we shouldn't be at the store and all this stuff. And Oh yeah. It's like, Whoa, hold, hold on, man. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where you've heard all of this from, but we have to buy our own food. We have to cook our own food. I mean, the, they don't give us this stuff. Yeah. Well, you should be at the station the whole time. Well, we work for 24, we work 24 hour shifts. And we have to eat. So, yes. Yep. And guess what? Whenever this radio goes off and says there's an emergency, we're going to leave all of this food in this cart, and we're going to go deal with that. Yep. Now, we'll be back, but that's first. So. And, and maybe that impacted his day. Maybe he thought, okay, well, maybe I was wrong. Yeah. Probably yeah. not. Probably yeah. not, no. but. <laughs> I wish the city paid for our food. Oh. <laughs> eh. I wouldn't be eating chili dogs and tater tots. Well, if I, mean, I, like, if I, mean, I, like, I like chili dogs and tater tots. <laughs> yeah. Hang on. Never mind. <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> I love chili dogs. <laughs> Whenever it's my turn to cook, yeah, that's what you're going to eat. <laughs> yeah, but at least you make the chili. Yeah. Has he made chili for you guys yet? Well, he hasn't been there long enough to. I mean, he, keeps, right, he can't bring donuts yeah. on his first yeah, day. Yeah, I can't, forgot. You know, can't, can't even, even do the yeah, new guy stuff. I've, I've, yeah. Has he cleaned yet? Well, I don't know the answer. It's a no. <laughs> I've worked with him long enough. I know he doesn't know how to. You got to teach him what a sponge is, and you have to go over it every single day. He's like 10-second Tom. Like a goldfish, huh? Yeah. How many dishes have I done since I've been there? One. Yours? A lot. (laughs) A lot of dishes. More than I should have. I don't know why you got to lie because there's a camera on. (laughs) (laughs) I've worked with you a long time. I know yeah. what you do. Yeah, well, you know, I was trying to be... He stands there with the mop and waits to mop. I have done that once or twice, yes. And then I somebody comes by that. and says, hey, give me the mop. He's like, okay, here you go. I'm not fighting for dishes. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, but so, you didn't even offer. Man, you don't even know. Just come down there and work with me. You'll see. You see a whole new mess. Whenever I actually show up. drive that far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be worse when he gets promoted, too. <laughs> oh, it's going to be so bad. He's going to look at his empty plate and look at you. It's a plate. Yeah. Come on. Come get I it. I might pull up my collar pins a little bit. <laughs> See that? He's going to wear, wear the dress uniform the whole time, too. Guarantee it. All the time. I will sleep in that thing. Yeah, you're that guy. <laughs> make, sure, make sure your shoes are all black. 
<laughs> and black socks. I, I so before before we wrap this up, I do have one serious question for you. Did you sand those uh, boards down last day yesterday? Man, I didn't. Because <laughs> there was no sandpaper. I will get some sandpaper. Yeah, and bring it in. I'm next I'm day. only one man. You yeah, know, I mean, I, I know. <laughs> would, you, would you make? Well, we have some cornhole boards. Cornhole and, boards. Uh, and we played the other day, and it was, uh, let's just say it hit was. Hit the board and stop, didn't it? Yeah. Or just shot off like seven feet away. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It just need a little bit of sanding, a little, little coat of paint. They'll be good to go. Yeah. So, yeah. I'll bring some sandpaper and we can see yeah. them. I think Friday. I have some paint, too. I mean, and then you have no excuse. Nope. You know, I'm pretty, yeah. pretty sure you lost that last game. Pretty sure. You're only as good as your last game. I'm pretty the, sure the last game where I threw three or two of them straight in the hole I'm to win. Sure, I'm, is that the game you're talking about, or the game before that where you guys didn't score any points? Why the br- two games before that, why you guys is he bringing up old shit? <laughs> 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 oh, it, it was wait, after wait. You, after your partner left. Yeah. That, that was when we just okay. Yeah, I wasn't okay. even playing. Yeah, that's I was right. sitting over yeah, there just you, being sad. You quitter. Yeah, <laughs> gotcha. Grandma's in the hospital. Those are. That's what that was about. Yeah. So. All right. Well, David, thanks for coming by. No problem. Talking to us. Appreciate it. Yep. Shedding yep. some light on some stuff. So. Anytime. Well, I'm sure we'll have more questions <laughs> later on. Yep. Well, thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's that's the awkward. typical response of thanks for coming by, thanks for having me, but you know, whatever, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, uh, thanks for stopping by. Um, if you're having a problem or you know somebody that's having a problem, reach out. Um, there are resources out there for you. So, all right, take care of yourself.